few announcements to get us started this morning. Uh, these are not our normal church decorations. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. Uh, so we have a, a great week ahead for the children of our community. Please be in prayer for them this week. We'll have a special time of prayer for them a little bit later in the service. And please pray for our volunteers. Uh, it is going to be quite the week for them as well. Uh, just a few other announcements. We do not have uh, our youth ministry small group tonight due to Father's Day. Enjoy your time with your families this evening. Uh, newsletter articles are due at the first of the week. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to just give you an update on the Southern Baptist Convention, given the announcement uh, that I made a few weeks ago. Uh, the convention was this past week, and uh, the convention did what we hoped and prayed they would do. Uh, they took steps uh, based on the report that had been filed uh, concerning uh, sexual abuse in Baptist, Southern Baptist churches uh, across the nation. And they uh, repented of those sins and adopted new measures to help make sure that those kinds of things will not continue in the future. So it was a, a good, uplifting, uh, and encouraging uh, time there at the convention this week. As we transition into our time of worship this morning, I want to read from Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather each week to worship and glorify your name because you have sent your one and only Son into the world so that we might be saved through him. And so I pray this morning as we sing, as we read your word, as we pray, as we give, that we would do all things to the glory of God, because you have demonstrated your love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We pray that you'd humble us this morning as we worship you, that you would open our eyes to see the sin that plagues us even today, and that you would lead us to gracious repentance, that we might rejoice with those in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I know you're thinking, finally, back to the book of Mark. I'm excited to be back myself. We'll be in verses 13 through 17 this morning. And it's been a few weeks since we left off in chapter 2, verse 12. So let me quickly remind us of where we've been to help us make sense of where we are this morning. Mark says in chapter 1, verse 1, that he's writing this whole account, this whole book of Mark, to share with us the good news, the gospel, concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And in less than two chapters, Jesus has already shown us his divine identity and his divine authority in all kinds of ways. He teaches with divine authority in the synagogue. He shows us his mixture of divine divine authority and divine compassion as he heals the sick, even the social outcasts like the leper. And he even has divine authority to forgive sins. That's what we saw in verses 1 through 12. The result is that the crowds love Jesus. Everywhere he goes, they flock to him. In Capernaum, if they see him, they call their friends and hustle to his house for healing and for teaching. But not everyone loves Jesus. The scribes and Pharisees, who are the religious leaders of the day, they don't love him. And starting in chapter 2, Mark lays out for us a series of five consecutive stories that reveal the growing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. The first was in verses 1 through 12, where the scribes take issue with the fact that that Jesus even thinks he can pronounce the forgiveness of sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone, they say, not recognizing that Jesus is God in the flesh, possessing divine authority to forgive sins. And in the passage today, the scribes and Pharisees take issue with the kinds of people that Jesus forgives. So stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word, Mark chapter 2. Verses 13 through 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him, that is, many tax collectors and sinners. Verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray. God, this is your word, and this is your word concerning your son. And so we pray that you would speak to us by your spirit to reveal to us the glorious news of the gospel, that Christ came to die for sinners like us. May we rejoice and worship as we hear this news this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The main idea of the passage is simple, and Jesus basically states it there in verse 17. Jesus came not to save the self-righteous, that is, those who think they're righteous, those who think they're good, but sinners. And the Bible teaches that there are two ways to miss the kingdom of God. We tend to focus on one much more than the other. The first way, which we all know, is rebellion. A life of immorality that disregards God's commands in the pursuit of our own personal pleasure. But there's a second way to miss the kingdom of God that Jesus highlights in this passage. And that is religion. Religion is a life of immorality, I'm sorry, a life of morality... A life of pride-filled rule-following that piles up long to-do lists in an attempt to impress God with moral superiority. 
But both the way of rebellion and the way of religion will keep you from entering the kingdom of God. So Jesus teaches in this passage that the kingdom doesn't belong to the rebellious person or to the religious person, but the kingdom belongs to the repentant person. Which means, point number one, following Jesus requires present surrender, not a past record of righteousness. Verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. So after healing the paralytic in verse 12, it appears that again, as we saw in chapter 1, the crowds in Capernaum have grown to the point that Jesus is forced out of the town limits onto the beach of the Sea of Galilee. And the crowds follow him there. Not a lot of me time for Jesus. And he continues teaching them. And after this teaching session, as Jesus is walking along the shore, he sees a man named Levi, verse 14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Now there's several things to note here to appreciate the significance of what's happening. This man Levi is sitting at a tax booth, meaning that he is a tax collector. Now tax booths at the time operated a lot like restaurant franchises today. You would buy the rights to operate the tax booth from the Romans, who were the ruling nation of Israel at the time. And each tax collector or tax booth had a certain tax quota that they were required to deliver over to the Roman government. The Romans only cared that you met that quota. Beyond that, the tax collector was free to run his operation as he pleased with security and protection provided by the Roman authorities. So arguing with a tax collector was about as productive as arguing with your medical insurance company. No matter how long you spent on the phone, nothing's going to change. And this system fostered exploitation based on the arbitrary power of the tax collector. So it didn't matter if you only owed $500 in taxes, they could charge you $1,000, send $500 to the Romans, and keep $500 for themselves. The result was that tax collectors were despised everywhere throughout the Roman Empire, not just in Israel. They were liars, cheaters, greedy, dishonest. So they were lumped in with the worst kinds of people in society. To make matters worse, this specific tax collector's name is Levi. His name would later be changed to Matthew after he becomes a disciple of Christ, and he wrote the first book in the New Testament. Levi is a Jewish name, named after the order of the Levitical priests, which meant that this wasn't some low-life Roman exploiting the Jewish people. This was a fellow Jew who had volunteered to oppress his own people for the sake of his own wealth and job security. As a result, Jewish writings reveal that tax collectors were seen as traitors, and they were listed right alongside murderers and robbers. In Scripture, you see tax collectors listed next to extortioners, adulterers, and prostitutes, the morally bankrupt of society. If a Jew became a tax collector, his membership in the synagogue was revoked. He was disqualified to serve as a judge or a witness in a Jewish court of law, and he was actually considered a Gentile, culturally disowned in a sense. You guys will like this one. Although lying was condemned based on the Old Testament, lying to a tax collector was considered appropriate. It's not an excuse to lie to the IRS. <clears throat> Somebody can give me a bottle of water. The words, follow me, are not an informal expression for Levi to hang out with Jesus on the weekends. Jesus invites this tax collector, who was a moral outcast and stained among his Jewish people, to be his disciple. 
This was the formal invitation of a rabbi to a student. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if you look at chapter 1, verse 17, my cap just went under the pulpit. <laughs> chapter 1, verse 17, where Jesus called Simon and Andrew to be his disciples, he uses the same language. He says to follow me. But any reputable teacher wouldn't risk the legitimacy of his reputation by calling a disciple who carried such baggage. And yet Jesus does. And it teaches us this very important truth about Jesus, that becoming a follower of Christ doesn't require a past record of righteousness. Jesus doesn't look at Levi in the tax booth and say, you know, Levi, I see some potential in you. I, I think that you've got the makings of a great one. You may even write a book of the Bible one day. But before you can associate with me, before I can be seen with you in public, here's what I need you to do. I need you to apply for membership back at the synagogue. You know, and I, I need you to get back in church. I need you to start volunteering in the community. I need you to start giving your money to some good causes. And I'll be back in a few months to check in on you, and if you're doing okay, then you can be my disciple. Jesus doesn't say that. Why not? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If Jesus required us to complete a 12-step plan before coming to him, then we would be coming to him after we proved ourselves worthy. But the whole point of the gospel is to show the extravagant love and grace of God that was extended to us when we weren't worthy. To show us that Jesus meets us where we are, not where we should have been. That's why Paul can say in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 15, this brief biography of his life. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent of the church. So if you don't know, Paul's background was that he arrested men and women who were Christians and had them thrown in prison. And in spite of that life, he continues, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. For those of us who are tempted to think that God loves us on the basis of us, the call of Levi should make us humble because we realize that our past record no matter how good, makes no difference in our salvation. And for those of us who are tempted to think that God could never save us, the call of Levi gives us hope because we realize that our past record, no matter how bad, makes any difference in our salvation. <clears throat> because we aren't saved on the basis of our record, but on the basis of Christ's sinless record. So following... Jesus doesn't require a past record of righteousness, but it does require present surrender. Notice, Levi doesn't hesitate. Mark writes, and he rose and followed him. Luke adds, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. This split-second decision would have a lasting impact that couldn't be reversed. You don't ditch the Romans and come crawling back for your job later. Leaving the booth meant leaving the wealth and the career and the income without gaining back your social standing. It's not like his reputation was built back overnight. And so this radical call was met with radical surrender. Just like Simon and Andrew who immediately left their nets and James and John who immediately left their father and their boats, Levi immediately leaves the tax booth and follows Jesus. And don't miss this, because it's easy for folks to twist this passage and mischaracterize Jesus. Jesus doesn't condone the tax collecting. 
He doesn't say, stay at your tax booth, keep ripping people off, but you can call yourself my disciple. He meets him where he is, at the tax booth, in his sin, but then he loves him enough to call him out of it. Just like a woman caught in adultery, Jesus says to her, I do not condemn you, which is a powerful word of grace and forgiveness, but it's followed by the words, go and sin no more. So Jesus loved Levi in spite of his sin, and then he loved him enough to call him out of his sin. And Levi surrendered to that call and left his life, his previous life, behind. Now the reality of Levi's call begs this question. How would you treat Levi if he showed up in church next Sunday? You know his reputation. You know what he's been up to. He may have even stolen money from you at the tax booth. You despise him as a traitor and a cheat. But now you see him at church mingling with the pastor and the deacons. What conclusions do you jump to? How does this affect your view of Levi? And how does this affect your view of the pastor? What we see in the next section is the contrast between how Jesus dealt with sinners and how the Pharisees dealt with sinners. We see point number two. Jesus came for the repentant not the self-righteous. Verse 15. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So the scene shifts from the tax booth to Levi's house, and Levi is throwing a banquet, a feast, a party, and Jesus is the honored guest. This scene mirrors the familiar one from Luke 19 where Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus, also a wealthy tax collector, and Jesus declares, today salvation has come to this house. So having received the invitation to follow Jesus, Levi throws the celebration, and he invites all of his closest friends, who just happen to be tax collectors and sinners. That word Sinners here is a broader term that describes the different kinds of people that were associated with tax collectors. Namely, prostitutes, adulterers, thieves, and blasphemers. The rest of the morally unclean people of society. Mark repeats the word many twice in verse 15. He says there were many tax collectors and that there were many who followed him. So this isn't just a couple of friends that Levi had over. This is a gathering of the riffraff of Capernaum. And like tax collectors, these, quote, sinners were also put out of the synagogue. Meaning that Jesus is coming to Levi's house purposefully and intentionally to extend the reach of his mission. We saw in Mark 139 that his primary strategy for spreading the news of the kingdom was to go into towns and preach in the synagogues. But these people aren't allowed in the synagogues. Which meant that for Jesus to reach this new segment of society, he had to go to those who couldn't come to him. The mission of the church is not to separate from sinners. The mission is to save sinners. For some, they'll be comfortable enough to come into our church and hear the message of the gospel. But for many, they will not come to us, which means that we must go to them. And when we go to them... When we, like Jesus, become friends of sinners, you can count on it that whistleblowing Pharisees will show up. Verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is not an innocent question of curiosity. It's a hostile accusation in the form of a question. And they don't even have the nerve to address Jesus directly. So they go to his disciples. Classic Pharisee move. Lurking in the darkness. Creating division and controversy through whispers and rumors. They are appalled at Jesus' actions. And to fully understand why, you've got to understand both the nature of the Pharisees and the nature of this meal. So the title of this group, Pharisee, means separate ones. They believed that purity was achieved through segregation. 
They have no dealings with tax collectors or sinners or Gentiles because to do so would compromise their moral purity. They thought that sin was like cooties. Don't touch a sinner because their sin will rub off on you. But not only were they misguided in their understanding of purity, they also completely underestimated the power of Jesus' purity. When Jesus did the unthinkable back in chapter 1 and touched the leper, he didn't become dirty. He made the leper clean. And when Jesus touches a sinner, they don't make him dirty. He makes them clean. So the Pharisees are angry because this massively popular teacher is doing something that they consider improper and impure. But they're also angry because of the meal itself. And the meal shows us two things. First, a meal in someone's house implied acceptance of them as friends and brothers. In Acts 11.2, Peter is criticized by the Jews because, quote, you went to Gentile men and ate with them. The meal symbolized the acceptance of fellowship. So the Pharisees are angry that Jesus is extending fellowship and acceptance to such sinful people. But, number two, and more concerning to the Pharisees, is that like Zacchaeus, they know Jesus is going to Levi's house to share a meal and extend forgiveness and entrance into the kingdom. This popular rabbi from Nazareth isn't just defiling himself, he's defiling the kingdom of God. That's their concern. Because the kingdom isn't fit for tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus hears this accusation come to his disciples and he responds himself in verse 17. It says, And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. This was a common proverb, both in Israel and other nations at this point. And so Jesus points out this obvious place of agreement so that the Pharisees couldn't dispute it. You don't need a doctor when you're well. Thankfully, I haven't had to go see Logan, because my eyes are fine. But when my eyes aren't fine, what do I do? Go to Logan. Charlie was sick a couple weeks ago, and we avoided the doctor as long as we could. With medical costs being what they are, you only go to the doctor when you absolutely have to. And this is what's so infuriating about the Pharisees and those who cling to a Pharisaical mindset today. Pastor Kent Hughes tells this story in his commentary. He says there's a poor woman in 19th century England who attended a church's women's meeting. She had been living with a man who wasn't her husband, and he was a man of a different race. She got pregnant and brought this mixed-race baby with her to the Bible study. She really enjoyed the meetings, and so she kept coming again and again and again. But one day, the pastor of the parish approached her and said, I must ask you to not come to this meeting again. Seeing the confused look on her face, he continued, the other, woman, the other women have said they'll stop coming if you continue to come. And looking at him with desperation, she asked, Sir, I know I am a sinner, but isn't there anywhere a sinner can go? If a sick person can't go to a doctor for treatment, where can they go? If a sinner can't go to the only place or person where there's forgiveness, then where can a sinner go? Matt Chandler, a pastor in Texas, tells a story about his early days in college. He and some friends had met a woman whose life was a mess. They had befriended her and invited her to a worship night at this church. And in the course of the service, the speaker got up and he held up a beautiful rose. And he threw it into the crowd, and he told everyone to pass it around, feel its petals, smell the rose. At that point, he continued on to his sermon, which was a sermon about sexual purity. 
In reality, it was a sermon about sexual impurity. All while this lady, who was in no way pure, was sitting there taking it all in. And the big crescendo of the sermon at the end was that the speaker asked for the rose back. So he went into the audience and he grabbed it and he came back up to the pulpit and he held up that rose. And the rose, which had started nice and neat and pretty, was now bent and mushed and crumpled as it had passed through the hundreds of hands. And the point of the illustration was this. Like a sexually immoral person, it had been used over and over and over again and was now broken. And the pastor, with condemnation in his voice, held up the rose and said, Now who would want this? Matt Chandler said it took everything in him not to stand up in the middle of the service and say, Jesus wants the rose. That's the whole point of the gospel, Romans 5, 6 through 8, that while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. That God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't wait for Levi to clean up his life before he called him to be his disciple. He met him where he was, in his sin, in the tax booth, and said, follow me. The sin of the Pharisees is that they stood in judgment from a distance while withholding the very thing that the sinners needed to be pure. It's like watching someone drown while holding a life preserver in your hand. That's why they were enemies of Christ and enemies of the gospel. Because Jesus, who knew the same thing that they know, it's not like he was oblivious, he knew these people were sinners. He knew that they were broken. And he came to bring them the forgiveness and healing that they needed. He was the solution to their problem. And he didn't withhold himself. To the point that he didn't just eat with them. But he went all the way to the cross and suffered and died for them. To take the burden of their sin so that they could enjoy the fruit of his righteousness. So the passage ends with Jesus giving a scathing rebuke of the Pharisees. I have come not to call the righteous, or those who think they're righteous, but sinners. And Luke adds, to repentance. This is why we celebrate Christmas every year, in the incarnation that God came in the flesh to live and walk among sinful people to cleanse sinners and call sinners into fellowship with Him. But here's the warning. If you think you're so righteous that you don't need forgiveness, then the kingdom of God is not for you. The kingdom isn't for people who think they're good. It's for people who know they're bad. It isn't for people who think they're whole. It's for people who know they're broken. And cry out to God for mercy. And so we close with two questions in application. So what? First, what is your attitude towards, quote unquote, sinners? Consider the sinners of our day. The sexually promiscuous. The drug addicts. The drunkards. The adulterers. Those who differ from you politically. What is your attitude toward them? Are you like the Pharisees, standing far off as an agent of judgment and condemnation? Or are you like Jesus, drawing near as an agent of reconciliation and transformation? There's a simple principle here. To reach the lost and broken, you have to be with the lost and broken. When I was a kid, I used to hate when my dad would stand on the sidewalk and watch me cut the grass. Because I knew he was watching and waiting for me to mess up so that he could come correct it and show me how to fix it. And I would think to myself, Dad, don't just stand there. If you want it done a certain way, then you come do it. Do you sit back in judgment, condemning others for their, quote, filthy way of life? while you stay nice and clean at a distance? Or do you get in there and get your hands 
dirty because you know that you're not any better than they are. You also required forgiveness and cleansing. So do you move toward them with the love and compassion of Christ, not to condone their sin, but to extend the only hope they have of forgiveness and cleansing? I don't know exactly what that looks like for each one of us, or even for us as a church as a whole. But maybe a good first step is for us to intentionally create times and places in our lives where we're around non-Christians. I was convicted by this paragraph from a, a commentary that I read this week. He said, we tend to arrange our lives so that we are with non-believers as little as possible. We attend Bible studies with Christians, Sunday school with Christians, prayer meetings with Christians. We play tennis with Christians and eat dinner with Christians. The result is we pass by hundreds of non-Christians without ever noticing them or positively influencing them for Christ. Listen to this last sentence. Few, if any of us, are Pharisees philosophically, but we may be Pharisees practically. Like Jesus, how can you consciously think of ways to go to the kinds of people who would probably never come to you? Second question. Have you enjoyed God's warm reception of the repentant? I know the word repentance has come to carry overtones of judgment in today's culture. Turn or burn, as the ignorant say. But the command to repent isn't an announcement of condemnation. It's an invitation to forgiveness and transformation. It's an invitation to come to the one who created you and died for you and say, I'm not doing life my way anymore. I'm ready, like Levi, to leave everything behind and follow you. So when Jesus calls sinners to repentance, he's inviting you to turn from your life of sin and destruction into a life of obedience and joy and healing. And scripture tells us that the result of repentance is rejoicing. Luke 15, 7. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The disposition of God is that those who repent are received with rejoicing. When the prodigal son returned home after spoiling his father's money on partying and prostitutes, the father doesn't stand there with his arms crossed, tapping his foot, saying, I was waiting for you to get here. No, it says he ran to him, kissed him, and threw a party for him. My son, who was lost, has been found. And it's his self-righteous brother who misses the celebration because he's too busy feeling sorry for himself. God rejoices when we come to him, confessing our sins, because when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think it's fitting that at the end of the book of Revelation, one of the pictures that shows us God's fellowship with his people is a banquet, a feast called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus will spend eternity eating with sinners, sinners who have been made righteous through his death and resurrection. And so if you're here this morning and you have never repented of your sin and come to Christ for salvation, I want to invite you to do that this morning. And if you're here today and you are a Christian, but you know you need to repent of an arrogant, judgmental attitude, you want to come forward and ask for prayer or kneel down here at the altar, I want to invite you to do that as well. I'll be down front as we sing our closing hymn of invitation. We'll be happy to talk with you as the Spirit prompts. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this good news concerning your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Romans 8.1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that for those of us who have seen our sin, no matter how severe or 
grotesque or unforgivable as we might think that it is, and that your word promises forgiveness and cleansing for those who come in repentance and faith. So I pray for those of us this morning who have received that, that our hearts would not limp with guilt, but would worship in the freedom of forgiveness that we've received through Christ. And I pray if there's an unbeliever in here in the room that you would convict them of their sins and help them not hide it in guilt and shame, but to bring it to the cross to receive forgiveness and cleansing. God, we pray for all of us who are prone to pride through our moral superiority. We pray that we would not look down our noses at those who are broken and in sin, but would throw the life preserver that is Jesus Christ, and would do so with love and compassion. We pray that you would give us proximity to sinners, that we might love them into the kingdom. We pray that your spirit would move in our hearts now as we sing. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.